Thank you for joining me for my High Fleet After Action Report for my Hard Mode Campaign playthrough. I really enjoyed doing the After Action Report for the Normal Mode playthrough when I completed it. I found it a really fun exercise. It was quite good just to cast my mind back over the campaign, think about what I'd done right and what I'd done wrong, and then talk about it for a little while. So I've decided to do it again for this one, and I know there's a few people out there who are quite keen to see me do it, so here you go. Just before I start, the sleepy pupper is in the room with me, so if you hear any weird snoring noises when I'm talking, it's just her. She's curled up in a seat next to me, and I'm quite happy that she's been she's here. So yeah, uh, let's get started. What I want to run through in this presentation or video is we're going to have a look at the campaign as a whole. Just did we win? What was good? What was bad? We're going to talk about where we had great wins, where we had great losses. I'm going to go into the campaign and show you on the map kind of where those things happened. We're going to look at some tactical notes I've made about how our ships fought or things we need to think about for the future. We're gonna go through the ships in the campaign, some of them in a bit of detail, some of them just as a little bit of an overview, what worked, what didn't work, what I liked, what I didn't like. And then we're gonna talk about next steps for the channel, mostly what are we doing about High Fleet in the future, what are our plans and what am I thinking about? And that's what we're gonna end up with. Just to kick things off, the campaign is an overview, great success overall. There were some issues along the way, but we completed our primary objective, which was to take Kiva, protect it from nuclear attack and end the war with the gathering. So mission complete. Our secondary objective was to bring most of our ships from the start of the game to the end of the game, came, and we did that bar a lot of our frontline ships. So unfortunately, the Zerskis, our the Audacity, um, the Rooster, they all fell along the way, which is a shame, but they did what they needed to do. They were all heroes of the Imperium, or the, what is it, the Saiyadi Empire? The Romani Empire, there we go. I should have had that written down. Uh, they did their jobs. The, the Rooster itself was a hugely powerful ship. The Howlers as well, we'll talk about them in, in more detail later, were very, very powerful ships. The logistical um, abilities that they had to keep me in the fight and to move things around was unprecedented. And they were great scouts, and they were great in their crybaby role. I'm, I'm really excited to talk about them in more detail later on in this presentation. Um, and then, you know, we have to acknowledge the fact that we did have some big mistakes. We took some fights we weren't supposed to. We lost ships to things that we shouldn't have. Um, there were some issues with missiles hitting the wrong ships. And we took a nuclear missile hit on Kiva that shouldn't have ever happened. Well, that is a bit of a bug in the game. Um, and we weren't able to pick up all of the Tarkans, or, nor were we able to speak to Alashia. So we didn't technically complete the story. But we won the war, and that is a very important thing to acknowledge that we did do. So all in all, I'm quite happy with how this campaign ended. I acknowledge that there are things I could have done better, but I'm really happy that there are because I would hate to have done it perfectly and then have nowhere to improve. Um, just to have a couple of interesting notes before we get into the nitty gritty. Uh, this campaign took me 52 days in game time to complete, at least if I read the save file correctly. Uh, looking at my notes from the last video, my last campaign took me 36 days. So this campaign took almost twice as long as our first one, not quite, but we're getting close. And I think that's really interesting to think about because in that campaign, we actually had to wait for the Sevastopol to be rebuilt. I landed the Sevastopol in a hidden city and I rebuilt it from what it was into a battleship. Uh, and that took quite a while. And that, for me, made the campaign feel like it took a very, very long time. But it didn't even take as much, anywhere near as much as this campaign where we didn't do any of that. There was at no point where we really sat and waited a long time to rebuild any ships. There was lots of repairs going on, but usually when repairs were happening, we were still moving in other theaters. In this campaign, I don't really think we sat around on our laurels for very long, but it took a lot longer to complete. Uh, there were 28 videos in this campaign, which is nowhere near as many as our last one. And um, I started recording this on the 14th of December and recorded my last video on the 24th of June, or uploaded my last video on the 24th of June. So it took me about six months to get all the videos out. And that was a lot longer than the last campaign as well, because when I did that one, I was only producing high fleet content for my channel. Now I've branched out a little bit, which I hope people like. I'm certainly enjoying playing other tactical strategy games on the channel. And so it's taken me a little bit longer to get the videos out, only doing once a week. But two things that I think were really good about that. One, I committed to getting a video out every Thursday, and I don't think I missed that. I maybe it was a little bit late a couple of times, but I think I hit that commitment, which I'm really happy with. And two, this uh, campaign was tactically a lot more taxing than the last one. And because of that, having an extra bit of time to think about what my next steps, what my next steps were going into the next video actually helped me out a lot. It was able to let me just take a step back, think about what was going on, and then move into the next video ready with an action plan to get out of the situation we were in. I've actually taken the campaign objective slide from my last after action report and put it into this one. Uh, this is my, this is what I was, this is what I ended the last presentation with, talking about what I wanted to do in the campaign that I just completed. So my design goals to kicking out were that I wanted a custom fleet, I wanted to design the ships from scratch, all of them. I wanted them to have well-defined roles and I wanted to work within the budget that the game was giving me for completing my last campaign. 
I gave myself the objectives of destroying all the strike fleets, taking the fleet HQs, recruiting all the targets, and staying silent. I wanted to play this like a submarine simulator almost and not let the enemy know where I was. My main concerns coming into this were the changes from the 1.13 to the 1.14 meta. Uh, big ones being that engines couldn't be elevated anymore, so you couldn't build a ship with the engines contained inside the ship. Engines themselves were much more expensive. And guns were, it was much more harder to elevate guns. If any of you have seen my Sevastopol rebuild video, you'll notice that that video is no longer valid and it's because of the changes made in the 1.14 patch. You could no longer elevate guns above fuel tanks as easily as you could before. In addition to that, 1.13 changed the game so that enemy ships used proximity fuse and armor piercing ammo when it was prudent for them to do so. And it meant that ships with smaller ammo, are, sorry, smaller ships with no armor died very, very quickly, but also bigger ships that weren't armored adequately or had uh, modules behind the armor that were vulnerable could also die very, very quickly. It also made armor heavier and more expensive, so ships were slower and more expensive as well. Looking at all of this as a whole, I went into the campaign with a a premise of building a robust multi-role fleet that was designed to be capable of thriving in the environment. Now, did I complete that design goal? I'm not sure. Let's just have a look at this. Oh, I'm sorry, I've gone back a page. Of course I've gone back a page on recording. So here I am talking about the same thing. This is my current like step away thoughts. So custom fleet, first of all, I wanted to build a custom fleet of multi-role ships. Did I do that? I don't think I did. I think the ships that I built were actually very singularly defined roles. They weren't multi-role. They were um, they, they were set to do one thing and do that one thing well. And in that, I think they performed very, very well. The ones that did perform well were high performers. The ones that did perform very well were low performers. We didn't really use them very much. You'll notice that Tyrannus didn't do much. I also found the budget very tight to build to. In terms of the objectives for the campaign, yes, I destroyed the strike fleets. Yes, I took the fleet HQs. Yes, I recruited most of the Tarkins. We did miss a couple, but I did not stay silent. I was actually loud for most of the campaign, and I was actually taunting the strike fleets to bring them to us. During the campaign, 1.15 hit, which further slowed down our ships because it caused um, the game to recalculate their weights. And this slowed down some of our faster ships that were designed to be kind of at the forefront of our battle plan. The biggest casualty here was the Collingwood. The Collingwood was supposed to be a much faster ship. It was supposed to be a fast brawler and it ended up being the slowest um, ship in our fleet and actually dragged us behind for quite a lot of the campaign. Uh, the hard mode garrisons did prove to be harder than anticipated. This was my first time playing hard mode and beyond just checking the first couple of towns, I hadn't really gone into the campaign in depth to see what it was gonna be like. And it meant that I had to take some really big risks with my ships to pull through and get the victories that I needed. If I had come into this with a different headspace, I may have built little strike fleets of bombers backed up by brawling ships that wouldn't have had to take as big risks as I did relying on one ship to do all of the work. A big problem with this campaign as well was morale. Uh, we were struggling with morale pretty much from the start of the campaign, and we had to sit and wait for morale to build up on our ships where they had R&R &R and cities, which caused those cities to tell the enemy strike fleets where we were, and we were stuck in a cycle of landing and having to flee before our crews were rested because there were missiles or planes incoming on our position. Uh, the strike groups made the campaign very difficult. They caused us to reposition. They caused us to have to make some very difficult decisions, which I really like. I found it very compelling that I was forced to change my entire tactical strategy quite early on in the campaign because of how the strike fleets were positioning themselves against me. Special mention I want to make to ammo types as well. I went into the campaign wanting to make use of laser guided ammo and I think I demonstrated very well how powerful it is. Um, the laser guided ammo on the D80 Molot, that 130 millimeter round is incredibly powerful and was able to strip most enemy capital ships that I fired it at very, very quickly. I didn't use it very much, but incendiary ammo is also very good and I want to explore that more in my next campaign. And one thing I want to posit to the community is we had aircraft in our fleet. We had missiles in our fleet. Personally, I felt that the aircraft massively outperformed the missiles. I felt that the aircraft are multi-role, they're reusable, they're cheap, uh, and they have long range, much longer range than some of the missiles, the A100s especially. Uh, whereas the missiles are one shot, one use. It's very easy for, for me personally to miss with the missiles. They can be jammed. And quite often the target that you're firing at them at, at has sufficient anti-missile defenses that those missiles don't get through. Whereas you can probably plan on losing two to three planes on an assault and still do considerable damage with the old Saiyidi special, the 250 kilogram bomb or 122 millimeter rocket barrages, which are the main two ways of attacking with planes that are worth doing.
So I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about the campaign and how it laid out. And one of the biggest turning points in this campaign was when we were in the city of Gazan, which is very, very early on. If you look back down the map, Ur, where we started, is just here. We started off really strong. We sent our ships out in different directions. You can see we've, we've captured pretty much every single city in the area. Um, we were able to move really, really fast with our multiple um, Audacity class ships, and we took a lot of territory very, very quickly. However, by the time we had taken the sort of this line of cities here, Kila, Nimreth, um, the unnamed fuel city, Sardar, etc., we started to build up a lot of damage in our in our ships, and we had to stop and repair for a little bit of time. And while we were doing that, we also made a lot of noise because we'd gotten loud very, very early. And what was happening was the enemy strike fleets were all clustering in this region here. They were coming down from Eridu, Mitzpah, and Nimrod down towards Gezim. And I was able to detect them coming. I could see them on Elint. Um, and I was getting very stressed because this is a very thin bottleneck of cities. And the fuel that I had in my ship at the time, I was running low on money. I was running low on fuel. And I was also in need of quite a lot of repairs on my ships. I think the Collingwood had taken some damage at that point as well, taking Gezim. And I had to sit and make the decision of, do I try and push up through Shubit into Eridu and Mitzpah, or do I do something else? And I'm not going to lie, I sat and thought about this for a long time before I recorded the video that I ended up recording. One of the things I don't do is go back on myself. I kind of stick with whatever happened. I'm not safe coming or anything like that. So I had to really think about this because I felt that if I got into a fight with those strike fleets, I wasn't going to be able to get out of it at the time. And what I ended up doing was I came back from Gazim through, um, what city is this? Um, Tarashush, I think, to Shebad, and then from Shebad we refueled as fast as we could, and we leapt across the desert to Suva. And this long jump, we just barely had enough fuel to do it, completely blindsided the enemy strike fleets, which I think continued to pull down to this area here, and then it ended up having to catch up with us and come up through Mitzpah, and we ended up engaging them in Jaffa and Haran, after, and Jabok actually, this, this was a huge area here where I was hunting strike fleets. After I've had a chance to repair and refuel, you can see that we've got Dangerous and Suva because I stayed here refueling and repairing for so long. And that movement there from Shkazm to Suva, instead of coming north but going west and then north, was a game changer. It, it changed how I look at the game and it changed the outcome of this campaign, I think, because if we had stayed in this area here, I think we would have died and the campaign would have been over. So that movement there was one of the biggest wins for me in terms of the campaign. It was me looking at the situation and going, no, we can't take this on head on, even though I really want to. What are other options? And seeing that there was a way out, I really, really enjoyed doing that. I'm going looking at looking up from that point onwards, you can see one of the biggest issues I had with this campaign, where there is a string. We, we, we did okay here because we had a city that hidden people to work out of. But once we got past this point here, we get into a long string of dangerous cities. And you can see I pushed really hard northwards. Um, and then again, we ran into like a line of enemy fleets here. We had missile carriers, we had aircraft carriers. So I cut east here, snuck up the right hand side of the map, really struggled to just get enough time to repair my fleet. And then we came obviously up into this area here and here's Kiva. This is just before I save, I, I recovered from just before we took Kiva later on in the game, um, just to see where things were. So you can see that we actually kind of sprinted north and, and that is really something to bear in mind when I say that this campaign took 50, what, 58 in-game days, 51 in-game days? Because we, I pushed as hard as I could to get up here as fast as I could, just getting around enemy strong points and sneaking around them, rather than just going in and battering in the front door, even though it maybe felt like that. Um, it still took us a long time to get to the end of the campaign, and that's something that I find quite fascinating. It's, it's, it's definitely an interesting one, and I wonder, I really wonder, I wish I'd actually kept a save when I was at Gazim, just to see what would have happened if I had pushed north in an alternate universe. You know, what, what would have been the outcome there? Would we have been able to get away with it? I don't think we would have. And I think this was the right decision. And this is the really, this is the one I really wanted to talk about and bring up was the retreat from Gazim and the jump across the desert from Shebad. That was a big, big change in, in us being able to win this campaign. And that was a big moment. So yeah, uh, moving on, what I want to talk about next is the ships. So moving on, I want to talk a little bit about the Audacity class ship. On the left here, I have the Audacities as they were designed going into the campaign. And on the right, I have the final design of the Rooster 3 before it died later on in the campaign. There's some really cool things to see here. One, this ship performed fantastically. It was massively over engine, which was on purpose. It, had, it actually has um, seven engines, five NK25 um, vector wall thrust engines and two D80 or D30 um, stationary engines, making it incredibly high speed. This does make it very fuel inefficient, and you'll notice the original design has five fuel tanks. You might not be able to see them. I think I can highlight them for you. So there's some fuel tanks. No, it's not going to show up. There's some fuel tanks in the main part of the ship. 
And if I do this, yeah, you can see them here. So some fuel tanks here and here, we've got fuel tanks here and here, and some fuel tanks here as well. Um, those were not sufficient to get the ship in the air for long enough, and part of that was due to changes made in 1.15. The fuel efficiency wasn't as good. So you can see I've had to add extra fuel tanks into the chassis to get this plane, this ship in the air longer, and I've had to put them in exposed locations, uh, which is something I didn't want to do when I originally designed the ship. I built the superstructure here to keep the ship protected, to keep it so that it wasn't in a position where shots hitting, striking the top of the ship would cause that to explode. And in the end, I had to abandon that. Other things to look at was the original ship design had flare launchers. We have one, two, three, four flare launchers on that ship. The final design over the course of the campaign, they just got stripped away by constant battle damage and I wasn't able to replace them. So the, the flare launchers eventually were lost just due to attrition. The ship also got an increase in its armament. I added these um, brackets here so we could mount another two Zenith anti-air missiles. And we also added a thousand pound bomb to the bottom of the ship that towards the end of the campaign was actually proving incredibly powerful and doing a lot of work for us. Um, I also really like the ship because it looks like a little crab. I love all the little crab ships in High Fleet. I think it looks like a really compact design. I really enjoyed flying the Audacity. I thought it was a really fun ship to fly. I am still a very big fan of the dual 100mm um, AK-100 guns. I think they're excellent um, and I think this is a great ship. I will try and remember to include a pack um, on my Google Drive to all the ships that are used in the campaign, so if anyone wants to try them out, they can do so. But bear in mind, they were designed for 1.13 slash 1.14, and we are now in a 1.15 world, so a lot of them underperform. All in all, the Audacity was such a great ship, and I'm so happy I got to fly it. It did a great amount of work, it was cheap, it was effective. Yes, we lost them throughout the campaign, but they did so much damage before they fell. So much so that um, I will admit to writing a little bit of fan fiction about the, the rooster um, that is available on my Discord, although I don't think anyone has read it. It is there, hidden away. Uh, let me know on the Discord if you want to check it out. Um, but I, I just thought it was such a fun, fun ship to fly that I wanted to write some history for it. Okay, next up, I want to talk about the Collingwood. So the Collingwood was um, a design that I was really proud of at the time, but after playing it for a long time, I can see a lot of flaws with it. One of the ideas I had behind the Collingwood was that it was going to be an on-site procurement ship. A little bit Metal Gear Solid, the idea was to build a basic ship and find the components for it during the campaign. So the main way you can see that is in the center of the ship, the four main, the four primary gun mounts actually start off empty. And then by the end of the campaign, you can see that I've mounted four DAT mod 130mm cannons into those slots. This was on purpose, this was to save us money. Those guns are quite expensive and they are quite common on enemy defense ships. So the idea was as we went through the campaign, the Audacity class ships would be able to acquire that ammo, sorry, those weapons, and then we'd equip them to the Collingwood and that worked really, really well. The problem with the Collingwood was multiple. Um, it was a heavy ship, it was over armored for its size, but the armor itself wasn't effectively placed. Um, a lot of people don't like using sloped armor pieces like this, um, and that is a weak point, and that's probably what you'll notice if you look back on the footage, times when these armor was destroyed the first was when those were hit. Fuel tanks at the side here were very, very vulnerable to armor piercing amp um, shots destroying them. Uh, one really good thing, however, was you'll notice I've, I pointed out here, the central section of the ship where the bridge is was excellently protected. I surrounded the bridge with components that would not explode or damage, meaning that the ship was able to keep flying even when it was very, very badly damaged, and it was able to pull through in situations that it may have died if I hadn't designed it with that in mind when I put it together. Uh, other big problems with this ship were the legs were too, or were not deep enough to sufficiently support it when it landed. Um, it also had very, very unprotected engines. This lower part of the ship here um, only had reinforced superstructure, which was not enough to protect it from really any fire at all. Just above that superstructure, there was some ammo components as well. So any shots through would generally cause those ammo components to explode, taking the engines out, taking out a generator, and that's when the ship would start to struggle. Um, it's hard to see, but we did also have flares built into the hull, and the flares were very, very useful in combined with the two, um, two A-37 Sea Wiz guns and taking down incoming missiles. They worked together in tandem just to keep the ship safe, as the ship was way too slow to be able to avoid them. Um, if I was rebuilding the ship, I think I would have to sit and just really work out how armor works, because the way I built it wasn't efficient enough, and you'll have seen it in the campaign. This ship spent an inordinate amount of time in the repair bay. It took most of our money away from us getting it back up, back in touch, but we needed to keep it repaired because it was the only brawler that we had available to us. And when it was actually in a fight brawling, it did very, very well. The problem was getting it to the fight because it was so slow and easy to detect. So I think we could call this the Collingwood Mark I. I would love to revisit this design and come in with something better. But what I want to talk to you about next is the best ship in the campaign. The Howler. 
This ship is the MV of MVPs. I was so happy with the Howler. Um, all three of them were so good. We only had one left at the end of the campaign, um, and it did so much work. It was shuttling equipment around for us. It was scouting out enemy fleets for us. It was distracting enemy fleets with its ECM module. It was attracting missiles to it and then outrunning them. It was able to keep um, enemy fleets in visual range without them being able to attack it. It was just fantastic. This ship really redefined how I want to do warfare in High Fleet going forward, it's that powerful. It's what I think you call a paradigm shifter. It's very, very, very good. Uh, very simple as well, just two powerful engines, tons of fuel for its size, and I put an ECM module on it and enough power to power it, and that's all I've had going for it. Looking at maybe the Howler Mark II, I would love to give it a fire control radar and an Elint module and maybe a couple of vectoring thrusters so it can actually dodge if it gets into combat because the biggest the, the, the biggest threat to the Howler is getting into a combat situation with planes or missiles because it can't dodge them. Um, but apart from that, this ship, especially for how cheap it was, was so useful. Sometimes it's very easy to focus on a combat ship like the Rooster and be like, this is the best ship in the fleet. But usually it's something in the logistics area that's doing a ton of work to keep you fighting that's the real reason you win the war. And I can say without a doubt, without a smidgen of um, hyperbole that the Howler was the ship that won us the game. This is the ship that got us there in the end. So MVP to the Howler, the Prophet there, he agrees, or they agree. Um, it was a great ship. I'm looking forward to seeing what the Howler Mark II is like, keeping it cheap, keeping it fast, but giving it more utility. I can't wait to see how that comes out. Some other stuff I wanna talk about really quickly is we had a couple of fleet carriers. Um, honestly, they were just carrier ships at the end of the day. They were over-designed as far as I'm concerned. They didn't need the stuff that they had on them. Um, they could have sat back. I probably didn't need two of them. The idea was to have them as fast carriers that could reposition and do a lot of work. But in the end, they just ended up floating around in a blob with the rest of the fleet. And I probably could have built these better. Uh, one design note that I really like is I really like the idea of building um, car like towers on my cruiser craft ships to replicate the bridges of older naval vessels. I just think it looks quite cool. Um, and uh, Putting the bridge in them though is a bad idea. So you can see I put the bridge of the ship on the left. Whoops, I didn't mean to click the mouse there. I put the bridge of the ship on the left here. But in our flagship, the Frankston, um, you can see that I've actually well situated the bridge in the center of the ship surrounded by non-explosive modules. And that's just a good idea to keep these ships alive as long as possible. Luckily, we didn't lose either of these, but it, it wasn't the best. And I can really see a better way of building these. Um, maybe just better designed runways. Maybe we don't need five ships on a pocket carrier. The design, this was designed to be a pocket carrier, but maybe only two T7s would be enough. I'm not sure yet. I need to play with it a bit more. Worked very well as a large-scale fuel tanker, not so much as just a fast carrier. It didn't really do the job that I wanted. And the same can be said for the Tenaris as well, which is our fleet missile carrier. I was never really able to utilize those A100s effectively. I ended up spending a lot of money and a lot of resources getting it to the speed that I needed it to get to in order to use those missiles. And then I never really used them in an effective manner, which I'm quite sad about because the idea of using A100s, I think, is much better than using the slower uh, ballistic missiles. The A100s are fast enough to usually dodge a lot of um, anti-missile fire, but in this situation, I just wasn't able to effectively use it. And that's really sad for me because I wasn't able to do it in the previous campaign either. And one of my goals going into this campaign was to really make a good use of a fleet missile carrier, and I still haven't been able to demonstrate it effectively on camera, which I think is a detriment. They can be very powerful, and I have done it before. I'm just struggling to make it work Maybe it's because I'm too aggressive with my fighting style with my combat ships, I'm not sure. One ship that I really want to talk about is the Starfish class, the Sleepy Pupper, the Patrick, and the Starfish. Another set of MVPs for the campaign. These little pocket fuel tankers were so good. Just one of these and an Audacity class ship was the perfect companion little pair. We had Elint, we had IRST, we had high speeds, we had low drag, and we had really scary combat efficiency with these ships. One thing you might look at doing in the future is putting some bombs on them, send them in first as a bombing run and then bring the rooster in, that kind of thing. Um, but these were very, very good ships and they were very light and they were very fast and I was very happy with them. Um, so these, these were really, really good ships. So that's really everything that I wanted to talk about about the After Action Report. I've talked about how the um, campaign went as an overall thing, what went wrong, what went right. We had a look at the, the map for a little while and what big fights there were on that, etc. We had a look at what I thought about the ships. Next, I want to talk about what my next steps are for High Fleet on the channel. So I've got two ideas bubbling in the back of my head at the moment that I want to talk about. The first is that I want to look at putting together like a design competition. Not really a competition. It's going to hard, it's quite hard to explain. Um, 
but where the community can submit ships for various roles in our new fleet. But I want them to be boondoggles. I want them to have, uh, not to be perfectly built, I want them to have flaws. So I'm thinking that there might be a design bureau that different people build for and the, you know, the Emperor Society is, is giving stupid commands. Like he wants a, he wants a fast interceptor that uses rockets or something like that. And then you have to build to these designs or, or there's leftover um, elant modules so that every ship needs to have an elant module on it. Um, in a little bit of a role play way, I think it'll be fun to put these limitations on my ship. That's one of the ideas. The other idea is there is a mod that actually lets you replace the enemy ships with custom ships. And I wondered if it might be quite fun to get the community to design the new garrison ships. So build me a new um, Courageous, build me a new Gladiator, build me a new Archangel. I don't even know what they're what they are like until I hit them for the first time. That could be a lot of fun. So I'm going to think about those. If you like either of those ideas, or if, I, if you want me to explain them in more detail, just put a comment in the video below. I will reply to every comment. It's one of the things I try and do. And yeah, I just want to have a lot of fun with the next campaign, especially because I'm not sure if we're going to get any more updates to the game um, with the situation that's going on in Eastern Europe at the moment. Um, the creator of this game is, a, is Russian and they've been out of contact since the start of the situation in the Ukraine. Um, so I hope they're okay. And yeah, we won't really get much in the way of an update until that is all over, which hopefully will end soon. Um, I also want to look deeper into High Fleet modding. I know it's quite difficult uh, with the way the game is put together, but there are some good mods out there, and I want to look into what might be quite fun to add into the campaign. So if you have any suggestions, you know any cool mods, please let me know either in the comments below, or of course you can join the Discord. We've got quite a fun little community getting together there, and you can suggest stuff there too. A um, couple of last notes. Thank you so much for watching. I had such a great campaign. I really, really enjoyed it. It was exciting. It was tense. It was stressful. That's exactly what I want out of a game like this. Um, even though it sounds like it's the worst thing ever, it was really fun to play. I really loved having to think my way out of the situations we were in. I really loved seeing the ships I built perform really, really well. Every single time the rooster pulled it out of the, of the hat against a huge um, garrison, I was so excited to just be playing that game, playing that ship. It, it was a great time. Um, thank you very much for watching this video. Thanks for watching all the other videos. Please let me know what you think, if you've got any suggestions, anything for next steps. I hope you had as much fun as I did, and I will catch you in the next video. For now, I'll speak to you later.